Well, we uh, turn now to God's Word. We're uh, continuing our study this morning through the uh, Old Testament book of Exodus. We're getting very close to the end, just uh, two more Sundays after this Sunday. And these last chapters of Exodus are challenging passages. Uh, they're long. There's a lot of details. I'm about to read a long passage of Scripture with a lot of details in it that might uh, feel uh, tedious to you. It's the description of the, the tabernacle, which uh, was a tent where God dwelt among his people in the, in the Old Testament. And uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the tent itself. And then last week, uh, Matt uh, gave a sermon on the items that were inside the tent. And now we're moving outside of the tent, the court that was, uh, uh, it's an enclosed area around the tent. And, uh, you know, one of our convictions here at Christ Church is that every page of the Bible is inspired by God and is, is good for the building up of strengthening of our faith. And so we don't skip any of the pages. And so we're in a, in a challenging one this morning, but I think there's some, some really profound uh, truths uh, buried in all these details. So uh, let's, uh, let's look together now at Exodus uh, 38, and I'll make a, a few comments as we go along to make sense of of what we're reading. So Exodus 38, hear the word of the Lord. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Now the altar of burnt offering is the first thing described because the main uh, feature in the court outside of, of the, the tabernacle. And uh, this is, it's described, some of its, uh, its shape, five cubits was its length, a cubit was a foot and a half. And five cubits, its breadth, it was square, and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. And he made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all its utensils of bronze. And he made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze under its ledge extending halfway down. He cast uh, four rings on the four corners of the bronze grating as as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze, and he put the poles through the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it with them. He made it hollow uh, with boards. And then in this next passage, it talks about the, the basin. So there was an altar where they would cook uh, animals, and then and the priests were doing a lot of the cooking, and then there was a basin where they would wash themselves off before they'd go into the tabernacle, into God's house, so they're not all a mess when they go in there. He made uh, the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting, which interesting mention of women who were serving uh, in or around the tabernacle, uh, helping with the priests there. And then, uh, and then it goes on to talk about the court, which was an enclosed area around the tabernacle. This is what it says. And he made the court. For the south side, the hangings of the court were of fine twine linen, uh, 100 cubits. And their uh, 20 pillars and their uh, 20 bases were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side, there were hangings of uh, 100 cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 bases were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the west side were uh, hangings of 50 cubits. Their 10 pillars and their 10 bases, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the uh, front, to the east, 50 cubits, so the entrance into the tabernacle was in the east, uh, the hangings for one side of the gate were 50, 15 cubits with their three pillars and three bases. And so for the other side, on both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three bases. All the hangings around the court were of fine twine linen. And uh, the bases for the pillars were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. The overlaying of their capitals were also of silver, and all the uh, pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And uh, the screen for the gate of the court was embroidered with needlework and blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. It was 20 cubits long and five cubits high in its breadth, corresponding to the hangings of the court. And their pillars were Four in number, their four bases were bronze, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their capitals and their fillets of silver. 
and all the pegs for the tabernacle and for the court all around were of bronze. These are the records of the tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony as they were recorded at the commandment of Moses, the responsibility of the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest, Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer and embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. All the gold that was used for the work and all the construction of the sanctuary, the gold from the offering was 29 talents and uh, 730 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. The silver from those of the congregation who were recorded was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary, uh, a beka, a, a head, that is half a shekel by the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone who was listed in the records from 20 years old and upward for uh, 603,550 men. The uh, 100 talents of silver were for casting the bases of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil, 100 bases for the 100 talents, a talent, a base. And of the 1,775 shekels, he made uh, hooks for the pillars and overlaid their capitals and made fillets for them. The bronze that was offered was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. With it, he made the bases for the entrance of the tent of meeting, the bronze altar and the bronze grating for it and all the utensils of the altar, the bases around the court, and the, the bases of the gate of the court, all the pegs of the tabernacle, and all the pegs around the court. Whew! The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. All right, let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we uh, thank you for these obscure passages. And uh, Lord, we know that you have placed them in your word uh, for our good and to teach us about who you are. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit to instruct our minds, uh, inspire us, uh, lead us to worship of uh, your goodness and your grace this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're just going to jump right into our, our main points, which are uh, two questions that we're going to be uh, answering from this passage in Exodus 38. This is what the two questions are. What is the meaning of the altar? And what is the meaning of the court? Two simple questions. What is the meaning of the altar? The altar is the main thing in the court. And then what's the, what's the meaning of the court itself? And... Uh, and I think that the answers are actually deeply relevant to our spiritual lives. And so, uh, so we're going to jump right into it. Two questions this morning as we try to understand Exodus 38. The first question is this. What is the meaning of the altar? What is the meaning of the altar? And two answers I want to give to that question. The first answer is that the altar was the place of forgiveness. The altar was the place of forgiveness. And you see there, verse 1, he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. And the altar would have been the, the first thing you would have seen when you entered into the tabernacle complex. Uh, you'll notice later in verse 18, you see where it says, And the screen for the gate of the court was embroidered with needlework and blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. So on the east side of the, of the, the uh, fence that went around the tabernacle, there was this screen that you would pass through that you walked into this enclosed area. And when you walked through that screen, the first thing you would see is this great bronze altar. And, uh, and uh, during times of sacrifice... There'd be hundreds of people and children that would gather into this space and they would bring animals to be, to be slaughtered and to be cooked. And uh, they would go through this process where the worshipers would lay their hands on the animals and it was symbolizing that their sin was being transferred to the animal. And the animal then would be killed as if the animal was dying in their place, taking the punishment for their sins so that they would be forgiven. And uh, the whole experience, you know, there's blood and there's smoke and there's these smells. It was a very sensory experience. And you imagine being an Israelite child growing up and many times experiencing this whole vivid encounter with God. 
And it would make this a profound impression on you that would say, the first thing that you need to know when you first, when you enter into God's presence, you have to be willing to admit there is something wrong in me. Before you can know God, you have to admit there's something wrong in me. I need forgiveness. I need my sins to be paid for. I need atonement. And that's the first lesson there. And that the altar was a place of forgiveness. And of course, that lesson is still the same for us in our worship service. I mean, what happens every Sunday when we come here? We hear a call to worship because it's God who calls us here. But at the very beginning of our service, every week, we confess our sins. And we say out loud and we say to one another, there's something wrong in me. There's something that I need to be washed of. There's something that needs to be healed and, and, and corrected in my heart that we come to God as sinners. And what it's teaching us is that at the center of human relationships, you know, whether that's our relationships with one another, it's relationships in a, in a marriage or with our children or, or in your workplace or in your broader family or, or friendships, and especially in our relationship with God, we have to be trained to say, I was wrong. I've done what I shouldn't have done. I've treated you a way I shouldn't have treated you. And I need forgiveness. Will you forgive me? That has to be a regular part of the Christian life, and it's at the center of our worship. God is training us to say that. And so the altar was a place of honesty, kind of a sobriety about that we're not really perfect people, that we are sinners, that we wrong God, we wrong one another. And so it's a place of forgiveness. Now, someone might hear that and say, you know, this is one of the things I don't like about Christianity is Christians are always talking about how we're sinners, how bad we are. And it feels like, you know, we're just loading ourselves up with shame and guilt all the time when we're talking about being sinners. And so I think you need to pair with the altar being a place of forgiveness, a place of honesty about our sins, with the second part that the altar was also a place of fellowship. So the altar was a place of forgiveness. It was also the place of fellowship. If you look at verse 1 again, it says, He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its breadth. It was square and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Now what's being described here is an epic grill. That, uh, you know, if you want to imagine having a grill like this in your backyard, it's seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. It's five feet tall. Like to get up to grill something, you had to walk up a ramp or up the stairs, and it's got horns coming off the corners of it. And so, you know, I know some of you think you have a Traeger smoker, you know, that you feel pretty impressed, that is impressive. This is Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, grill in his, in his yard. And uh, you'll even notice it says in verse 3, and, and he made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all its utensils of bronze. So these, the priests were grilling on this grill, and they have their grilling tools. You know, they're like a master, uh, master griller. And then it says in verse 4, and he made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze under its ledge extending halfway down. So the grating is seven and a half by seven and a half foot grating. I mean, you put whole animals on here to roast and to grill. I mean, it's just incredible. And, uh, and just like all the Israelites, you know, they're all living in these tents in the camp around, and then they cook their food outside of the tent. That's what God's house was like. He had his tent, and then he had a grill on the outside where he, where he grilled the food. And so if you think that Christianity is about moping around all the time about how bad our sins are and how sinful we are and how guilty we should feel all the time, that's not what this was about. I mean, the image that should come to your mind when you read Exodus 38 is, you know, on a summer evening when you're walking through your neighborhood and you sm someone is cooking something and you smell it and you know it's one of your neighbors. And maybe there's like a fenced-in backyard and you can hear a bunch of people back there. They're talking and they're, you know, having wine. They're laughing and they're being together and the food smells amazing. That's what the experience around the tabernacle would be. You'd be smelling these things from outside the enclosed fence that went around it. And... Uh, and, you're, and what you're thinking is, I want to be invited in there. I wish I was friends with that person. 
And that's what you're thinking around the tabernacles. I want to be at the tabernacle. It'd be the best meals that you ate all year happened at the tabernacle. That's what God wants to share with us, his children. The altar isn't just a place of honesty, coming to terms with our sin and being forgiven. It's a place of fellowship with God, of joy. And so, yes, you know, I mean, that's how all deep relationships are. They have an honesty to them, right? Like when there, if you have conflict or you have some elephant in the room that's not talked about and addressed, you're not going to have deep relationships. You know that you have to talk about those things if you're going to feel close to someone. But, and so God is that way with us too. And yet the goal is not to beat us up with our sins. The goal is fellowship. The goal is, is joy and welcome and feasting together. And so you picture all these families around the altar sitting and eating and feasting together. And so that's why in Psalm 84, we just sang song, Psalm 84. We read part of it. King David famously says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. This is great joy to go to, to, go to God's courts, okay? So first, what is the meaning of the altar? The altar is a place of forgiveness, honesty, you know, soberness about the brokenness in our lives, but it's also a place of fellowship, a place of joy and welcome and feasting. So, I mean, it's just a powerful image that those things are brought together in our relationship with God. That leads to our second question then. What, what more generally is the meaning of the court, this whole enclosed area around the tabernacle? And, and one of the things that we're saying is that the court is God's backyard, Right? So God says, you can't come into my house. His house is too holy for us to enter into. But the, all the Israelite children can come into his backyard and feast with him. But I want to talk about another interesting aspect of the court. And uh, you'll notice that this passage gives details about the dimensions of the court. So, you, for example, uh, verse 9 there. And he made the court for the south side the hangings of the court were of fine twine linen, a hundred cubits. So he goes on and he describes the south side, describes the north side, the west side, and the east side. And the important thing to note was that the shape of the court was what shape? It was, it was a rectangle. It's 150 feet by 75 feet is the, the size of this court. And one of the reasons that's important is uh, for the last ce century, critical scholars have said that the tabernacle actually never really existed. And what critical theory is, is approach to literature. So a passage like this, here's a piece of ancient literature, and a critical uh, scholar will say, what were the kind of cultural pressures that were going on when this author decided to write this? What was pushing him to write this? And what critical scholars have said was, well, about a thousand years after Moses lived when the tabernacle was being built, there were all these priests in, uh, under the Persian Empire who were trying to rebuild the Temple of Solomon. And they had this big building campaign going on. And so they were trying to convince all the people that this building was really important. And it goes all the way back a thousand years to the time of Moses. So they basically made up this tent that looked a lot like the temple that they were building. And they said, well, you know, if we give it this long thousand year history, people will think it's really important, and then they'll invest in their building project. And so they basically uh, invented the tabernacle. And so for 100 years, modern scholars have said the tabernacle probably didn't even exist. But uh, Ken Kitchen, Ken Kitchen is an Egyptologist, and he's an archaeologist of the ancient world in the Levant, uh, has pointed out that, that many cultures had these portable uh, tents, you know, worship structures that they moved around. And uh, in fact, one of the closest parallels to the one we're reading about in Exodus is an e e uh, Egyptian one, Ramses II, who lived around within 200 years of the time of Moses. Uh, Ramses had one that looked a lot like this. It had a tent with two rooms inside of it. This one has two rooms inside of it, except uh, there's a big difference that Ramsey, uh, Ramses lived in the most important room, and no one lived in God's room. God himself lived there. But, you know, you kind of think, well, where did these Israelites just come from? They've been spent 400 years in Egypt, and so their tent that they're building kind of looks like the Egyptian tents. And, 
But Kitchen goes on to say that the tense in the first millennium, sorry, I know there's a lot of dates. The tense in the first millennium, you know, when those priests want to build the, 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 this temple building, the portable structures were round. And so any archaeologist who sees this tent that's rectangular would know rectangular portable structures were in the second millennium during the time when Moses lived. And so, uh, and also you notice how much of the materials were made of bronze in the court, all the pegs and the, the altar and the, uh, and the basin, they were made of bronze. And Moses lived in the Bronze Age. Bronze Age ended in, in 1200 BC. And what all of this tells us is on the one hand, it kind of dates the Exodus story for us. It's like, oh yeah, this is the kind of literature that would come from the time of Moses. But maybe more importantly, what it shows us is how God enters human culture. The whole Bible is about God coming into human culture. Because I know that, you know, for some of you, when I say, oh, the tabernacle looked a lot like the Egyptian tabernacles, you'd say the Israelites did not get their idea for the tabernacle from the Egyptians. The Bible tells us that Moses went up on Mount Sinai and, and he saw a pattern for the tabernacle and he came down and told it to the people of how to build it. Even in this passage, it says in verse 22, Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. God gave Moses the pattern for how to build the tabernacle. So which is it? It was the tabernacle a picture of God's plan, or was it modeled after the Egyptian culture that they'd been in for the last 400 years? Was well, a false choice. It's both. And of course, there's all kinds of things like that in the Bible. Take the Bible itself. Is the Bible God's inerrant word that was inspired by God for God's people throughout all times? Or is it a cultural product that arose in, cert in certain cultures with certain genres and certain languages and the personalities of the authors even come through and the historical context that they were writing comes through. Which one is it? Is it a cultural product or is it God's word? It's both. Or you take Jesus himself. Is Jesus the eternal son of God, the maker of all things, the Lord of all nations uh, who existed before the universe began? Or is he a carpenter from Nazareth who spoke a certain language, wore a certain kind of clothing, ate certain kind of food, had a certain cultural context. Which one was it? It's both. And it's the same with the worship of the tabernacle, is God is entering a specific culture. And by the way, it's the same with our church. What are we? Are we people whose identity is in Christ and we identify with all Christians in every nation and throughout history, and we profess one faith, one baptism? Or are we Bellingham people who dress like Bellingham and the culture of our church is kind of like Bellingham? What should someone expect when they come in here? They should expect we're both of those things. And they come here and they should say, you know, these people are really different because they, they seem to have been loved by Jesus. Their, their lives are marked by a love that I don't experience out in the world. And yet they're like me. They seem to be like the people I work with and the people I mountain bike with and the people, you know, that, that I, I know in Bellingham. This is the paradox that is so important in the Bible. What it tells us is that the tabernacle is telling us the story of the Bible of, of, as a whole. When you get to the end of the Bible, what is the ending of the Bible? It says in the end of Revelation, the dwelling place of God is with man. I shall be their God, and they shall be my people, and every nation, every ethnic group will come and worship God in their own tongue, their own language, their own cultural expression. The diversity of human culture will not be erased, but will be sanctified and offered to God in glory. God is coming to dwell among human cultures. And that story is why there is an altar, the place of forgiveness and a place of fellowship. That's why there is a court where he welcomes his people into his backyard. And the God who welcomed the children of Israel all those thousands of years ago is the same God who welcomes, welcomes us into his courts today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we uh, praise you that uh, you not only have made all things, heaven and earth, 
but that you come down, you condescend to us. We see that in the tabernacle, you coming and dwelling with this nomadic people and welcoming them, welcoming them to find forgiveness and to feast with you. Um, and uh, we see that in our Lord Jesus, who has come down, the high king of heaven, to walk among us, to love us and offer us forgiveness and to eat with us. And so, Lord, we pray that this love that we behold here would mark us as a church that many would come to know you here, know that forgiveness and fellowship as well. Fellowship as well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.